I'm Vicki Cobb. I'm a children's nonfiction author greeting you from Greenberg, New York, a suburb of New York City. My friend and colleague, Roxy Monroe, who is actually in New York, is creating this program with me. More about Roxy in a few minutes. We are members of a nonprofit organization of about three dozen award-winning children's nonfiction authors called Inc. Think Tank. INC, I-N-K, stands for Innovative Nonfiction for Kids. Nonfiction means nothing is made up. Our work is about the real world. The books of all our authors are already in school and public libraries. We even have a database, the database on our website so that you can search for lists of books aligned to curriculum standards. But you may not have heard of us. Here's why. We're not as well known as fiction authors. Children's fiction is shelved in libraries and bookstores by the names of the authors and all the authors' books are in one place. Our books are categorized in shelves by the topics we write and are all over the nonfiction section of the library. You know who has discovered us? The creators of the standardized tests who excerpt our books for test reading passages that they quiz you on. We became an organization to focus attention on excellent writing about the real world. To this point, in 2014, we launched a daily blog for kids called The Nonfiction Minute. And now I'm going to show you exactly what that is. On every Saturday, we put together five nonfiction minutes, one for each day of the week. And they're in a long sequence. They look like this. Each minute is exactly 400 words long or less. And it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce us by um, sharing a minute with you that I wrote, this is this week's minutes. And as it happens, both Roxy and I have minutes up. So I'm going to share with you, this is the first minute I wrote. I wrote it because I wanted to see if I could write a minute. Then I'll tell you what these T2Ts are about and how they apply to my minute. Okay, so here is my minute. Um, I, since I'm interested in science, I write about science and we have an audio file. So the minutes are, they're, they're called a minute. If you're a good reader, it'll take you a minute to read one of these things. But if you're, if you want to listen, you can hear the author voice, vo author's voice reading them and it takes a little bit longer. So here I am reading you this minute. The nonfiction minute for today, how to extinguish a fire with a bag of potato chips by Vicki Cobb. That's me. Ever taste a stale potato chip? If not, here's how to make one. If you have an open bag of potato chips lying around, you can use them. Otherwise, open a new bag. Put a few fresh potato chips in a glass bowl in the sunlight and wait a day or two. Taste one of these exposed potato chips. Compare it to the taste of a chip from a brand new bag. Big difference, no? It's enough to worry a potato chip manufacturer. There are two things that make a potato chip stale. Can you guess what they are? Okay, I'll tell you. Air, specifically oxygen in the air, and light. So potato chip manufacturers know that if they want to keep their chips fresh, they have to remove oxygen and light. How do they do that? Take a close look at an open bag of potato chips. It is foil lined to make it light proof. An unopened bag is very puffy because it is filled with a gas. This puffiness protects the chips from breaking, but the gas in the bag is not air, which is a mixture of about 20% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. It is air without the oxygen, so it is mostly nitrogen. You can prove this. Oxygen is needed for fire to burn. If the air around a flame is flooded with nitrogen, the flame goes out. So you can use the gas in a bag of potato chips to put out a candle. Here's how. Light a candle 
Make sure you have an adult help you since this trick involves fire. Cut off the corner of a new bag of potato chips. Gently squeeze some of the gas from the potato chip bag near the candle flame. If you squeeze too hard, it's like blowing the flame out. You want it to go out because the nitrogen in the potato chip bag is quietly flowing into the space around the flame. Now you know how to extinguish a flame with a bag of potato chips. You have also proved that there is no oxygen in a potato chip bag, and you know why. Now go educate some grown up. And we include here um, a, a picture that shows the potato chip bag and the candle, and the candle goes out, but you can't squeeze it fast because it's like blowing it out. And here's a book I wrote. And now I'm going to show you the T2T. So this is something it has a lot of ways you can make a lesson out of this if you are a teacher and now i am going to stop sharing and go back to my pal roxy please introduce yourself hi i'm roxy monroe and i'm going to be uh vicky's going to be showing you the nonfiction minutes and i'm going to just give you a little info on each author so that folks was vicky cobb the master chef of kids hands-on science, who just published her 99th book. Uh, she recently did How Can We Harness a Hurricane? Why Can't I Suck Through a Straw? And the revised edition of her classic Forever in Print, Science Experiments You Can Eat, was recently reissued. And she's gone gorilla treking in Uganda, snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef, and hiked a Hawaiian volcano, and combined science and show business on her website with very entertaining one-minute videos. Vicki is the founder of Ink Think Tank, and along with author Alexander Sai, um, started the Nonfiction Minute a few years ago. So, and now let's see what Vicki has up for us next. Well, the next thing, of course, is we, Roxy gets a chance as host to share one of her minutes with her with you. So here she is, and I'm going to let her. T I'll scroll for her, but she she'll tell us what uh, what this is about. Bessie Coleman by Roxy Monroe. Bessie Coleman, better known as Queen Bess, was America's first black woman pilot. Born in Texas in 1892 into a world of extreme poverty and deepening racial discrimination, her dream to amount to something one day was fought against overwhelming odds. Working as a manicurist in a Chicago barbershop, she read about World War I pilots. She decided that she wanted to become a pilot. But she was met with the reaction, you, a Negro and a woman, you must be joking. Undeterred, Bessie sought the advice of a valued customer in the barbershop. Go to France, he said. The French are much more accepting of both women and blacks. But first, learn the language. That same day, Bessie began taking French lessons. A few months later, she sailed for France and signed up with an aviation school. Her training included everything from bank turns and looping the loop to airplane maintenance. In 1921, she became the first black woman to earn a pilot's license. Back in the U.S., an African-American woman pilot was big news. Thunderous applause and a rousing rendition of the Star Spangled Banner greeted Bessie at her first air show in New York. Memphis and Chicago followed. Bessie's future never looked brighter. She managed to buy an old Curtis Jenny, a favorite plane among barnstormers. She was heading for a performance in Los Angeles when the engine stalled. She crashed onto the street below, was knocked unconscious, broke one leg, and fractured several ribs. Distraught over having disappointed her fans, she sent a telegram to the local newspaper. As soon as I can walk, I'm going to fly. Seven months later, she was back in a barn plane performing to upbeat crowds in Ohio, Texas, and Florida. Bessie loved flying and accepted its risks, but her real ambition was to open a flight school. Sadly, she didn't live to see her dream realized. In 1926, her old, run-down plane went into a spin. Bessie was thrown out of her seat and fell to her death. At her funeral, thousands paid their respects to the brave young aviator. With their pluck and determination, Bessie Coleman had set an example for many Black people. Shortly thereafter, the Bessie Coleman Aero Club in Los Angeles became a reality. 
introducing young blacks to the world of aviation. Among those inspired by Bessie was Dr. Mae Jemison, the first woman African-American astronaut. And if we scroll down, we'll see her, um, her flying license. There's her French flying license. She came back to America and you heard the rest of her story. There she is training loop-de-loops. She was kind of a um, pilot. She went uh, to give these shows. They used to have these aeronautical shows with all these kind of tricks. And there she is flying over the countryside. So we can uh, get off that, uh, stop screen sharing. I'll tell you a little bit about my own work. Um, so I do science books and also books on art and architecture. I live in New York City. And I've written and illustrated more than 40 nonfiction books. Some of them have gamification elements like lift the flap concepts, ABCs, hidden images, mazes. And for my ecosystem and nature books, I've gone to the Arctic, rainforests, alpine, deserts, coral reefs. And a couple of recent books are Masterpiece Mix, Rodent Rascals, Dive In, just came out in April, Swim with Sea Creatures at Their Actual Size. And I have a book coming out called Rainforest that I'm working on in my studio today. Now, let's see what if we're getting any kind of fun things that uh, have come in on the chat room. And I think we have something lined up from Vicki. Yes, um, uh, it was, um, I think it was uh, Tasha. She offered a few things. And one of the things that she said was patterns and coding. I've got one on math if she's interested in that, but but I'm going to show you um, her her uh, this particular minute when this is how we're going to do it. We will start it so you get as a tease and you'll get the idea, and then later on we'll get, send you the link so you can read the whole thing. So this is Carla McClafferty, the unbreakable secret code, Cryptos by Carla Kalu McClafferty. Crypto stands in the shadow of the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, headquarters in Langley, Virginia, waiting to be revealed. No, Cryptos is not a foreign spy. It is a mysterious sculpture. The large curved copper monument is covered with 1800 cut out letters that together form four separate coded messages. The sculpture was created by artist Jim Sanborn, who was chosen to create it for the grounds of the CIA. I'm going to stop it there and I'm going to show you what the code, what it looked like. This is what the statue looked like. And the co this is, this is the fourth code of cryptos. If you're interested in, um, in, in trying to crack it. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. We'll get ready for the next one. Somebody else have something interesting to put on the on the on the um, on this post. Otherwise, I'm gonna put up something else by for math. But if but people, please, what do you, what what are you curious about? Nonfiction, yeah, things in, in real life. And right. I wanted to mention that Carla. Um, is a true polymath, and that means that she writes about everything, biographies. She likes to write about ordinary people who do extraordinary things, uh, social studies, science. She loves to research and compares it to a treasure hunt. She wants readers to connect with her people and understand historic people as just like you. They're real people. Sometimes they're happy. Sometimes they're sad, but they just persevered to achieve their goals. One of her books is In Defiance of Hitler. Another one is Buried Lives about the enslaved people of George Washington, it's Mount Vernon. And then she even did one called Fourth Down and in Inches about concussions in football. So she's, a, as I say, a polymath, a Renaissance woman who writes about all sorts of things. Now, let's see what Vicki's got for us next. Well, since nobody's making any suggestions, I thought you might be interested in, you know, we have to have a our temperatures taken now in this pandemic, everybody gets their temperatures taken. Well, Peggy Thomas has instructions on how to take an elephant's temperature in case you're interested. If not, you might get interested. 
How to Take an Elephant's Temperature by Peggy Thomas. My knees shake as I stand behind a coon larb, a towering female Asian elephant who rocks back and forth while the veterinarian explains the procedure. I pull on a rubber glove that goes up to my armpit and grease my entire hand and arm with a lubricant. Taking an elephant's temperature is one way the vet can assess the animal's health, which is important at the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation, GTAEF, in Thailand, where many of the elephants have been rescued from harsh lives hauling lumber or begging on the busy streets of Bangkok. The GTAEF is one of many organizations struggling to protect abused captive elephants. I'm going to stop it there, but I can show there's a picture of Peggy up to her armpit pit, taking the elephant's temperature. And now I'm going to throw it back to Roxy. So Peggy um, is, calls herself a curiosity queen. She writes also about a lot of subjects like science, social studies. And her nonfiction is driven by her curiosity, whether it's wondering about the earthier side of George Washington and Farmer George, which is a book on George Washington being a farmer, or um, how elephants think, uh, bird identification. She wants to spark your curiosity. She says that a nonfiction writer's process mirrors how children naturally learn. We follow our passions, ask a lot of questions, and seek out the answers. So she also did a book on Thomas Jefferson and another book on Peterson, who is the expert on birds and many other kind of really fun topics. So let's see what, and that was Peggy Thomas. Let's see what Vicki has coming up now. Okay, let me cue it up. This is a ringer, I have to admit, <laughs> because we have somebody in our audience who actually wrote this. So I thought she asked the question, what's it like to be a wolf? So here I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, here she's going to tell you, here we go. Oh, wait, sorry. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be a wolf? You're born in a cozy, dark den under the ground, probably along with at least one brother or sister. Your eyes are closed shut, but you can smell and feel your way over to your mother to drink sweet, warm milk from her teats. Your father and older brothers and sisters bring food from their hunts to feed your mother. Your eyes open in about two weeks, but you can't see much in the darkness of the den. You nap a lot, snuggling up to your siblings and your mom. Okay, I'm going to stop there because you can read a whole book of Dorothy's. And uh, this is a picture of the gray wolf that were the ones that were returned to Yellowstone and restored the balance. And now I'm going to throw it back to you. Well, so Dorothy it calls herself nature's animal ambassador, and you can see why. She does not only books on um, animals, but also on geography, U.S. history, the Plains Indians. And it comes naturally to her because as a child, she spent her time mostly outdoors, she says, collecting butterflies, snakes, and frogs. However, Dorothy has a PhD in zoology, and she's traveled all over the world, but makes her home in the big sky country of Montana. So her recent books are Super Snifters, uh, Sniffers about dog detectives, At Home with the Beaver about beavers, and Saving the Tasmanian Devil. So those are some of Dorothy's fun books. Now, I think he's going to give us something else. This is going to be fun. What? Yeah, I was, I was going to give a different one of Dorothy's, but we have another query from another ink author. So I thought I would show that this is um, in case you're interested in the Civil War. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to play uh, this, this part of this minute by Andrea Warren, who writes about um, what, what, history does to children, as a history from the point of view of a child who has lived through it. And for many of you who are living through the pandemic, if, pandemic, if you keep a diary, many years from now, you can go back and explain it. So this is what, this is about the Civil War. I'm Andrea Warren, and this is the Nonfiction Minute. Living in caves to survive the siege of Vicksburg. Incoming shell 
Whenever 10-year-old Lucy McRae heard that distinctive sound, she froze, allowing the explosive to fly on over her. Then she hurried into the safety of the family's cave. It was 1863, and Vicksburg, Mississippi was being bombarded by Union artillery. It was located strategically on the Mississippi River. All along the waterfront, Confederate cannon prevented Union ships from taking control of the river and using it to invade the South. President Lincoln said that for the North to win the war, those cannon must be silenced. He selected General Ulysses Grant to force Vicksburg to surrender. So this is quite a story and there is art to go with it. Here is Lucy McRae, a photograph. Phot photography was really a, came into its own during the Civil War. Here's a picture of Ulysses S. Grant. And here's a painting that showed uh, people terrified of a rocket. And here's a, a photo of a cave entrance after the siege. And you can see these, I don't think it's exactly very safe because you see all those unexploded shells. Okay, uh, go back to it. Okay, so that was Andrea Warren. And the wonderful thing about her is she looks at history through the eyes of children. She feels as though each of us wants to know if it had been me at that time, how would I, what would I have done if I was a child in these dramatic circumstances? So each child is caught up in a dramatic moment in history. They're true stories, of course. Uh, her settings have included the orphan trains. She did a book called Orphan Train Rider. The Civil War, you just saw that. The Pioneer, uh, Pioneer Nebraska, uh, Victorian England, the Nazi death camps and Saigon during the Vietnam War. Her recent book, The Enemy Child, the story of Norman Mineta, was a boy imprisoned in the 40s in a Japanese-American internment camp during World War II. It's quite fascinating, got all sorts of awards. Oh, um, I got the next one all queued up. Um, Vicki, did you see the one that came in from Charlotte? Wait, wait let me see if I can see that, uh, Charlotte. Babies and human development. Yeah, that's a that's a problem. I have to think about that one. Uh, we have we haven't written. I know. I have. I have. You know what? I got one. I did. Let me let me uh, let me let me put this one up first, and then then I'll go find the one that I did that does have something to do with babies and human development. Perfect. Thank you, Vicky. I knew you'd be able to search to find it. I, well, I have to. You know, I I, I know these very well. It's just that. Um, and I want to remind the, our audience that we have two or 300 of these. So if you go into our files on the right side, you'll see so many more. Okay, this is since Halloween is coming up. This one sort of appealed because uh, Amy Nathan writes about, this one is called When a Jet Wore a Costume. So we thought that was pretty interesting. My name is Amy Nathan. I'm going to be sharing a story with you today, a surprising story that I found out about when I was doing research for a book that I wrote about World War II. The story is called, When a Jet Wore a Costume. Two weeks before Halloween in 1944, a small jet fighter plane was parked on an Ohio airfield. The plane was wearing a kind of costume. It had fake propellers attached to the front of its wings. Was this jet getting dressed up so it could zoom off trick-or-treating at airports around the country? Not exactly. Those fake propellers weren't a Halloween prank. They were serious business, a disguise that the Army hoped would fool enemy spies. Okay, there's the tease for that. And there is some art that explains this. I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna go find you uh, this thing that could apply to babies. Okay, thank you. And in the meantime, I'll tell you a little about Amy. Amy lives here in, uh, in Larchmont, New York. She writes about dance and music, but a lot about social studies. Her books cover um, history, civil rights, as I say, music and dance. But the main thing is she has personal interviews with some of the people that she um, works with and that she writes about. She says they inspire her because they follow their dreams. They don't give up. And that she's hoping that the 
reading about them will inspire you and you can realize that anyone can do it. Her recent books include Yankee Doodle Gals about World War II aviators, civil rights books, and two recent ones, A Ride to Remember and Round and Round Together, have to do with the 60s civil rights when Black children were not allowed to go to amusement parks. And she has written some fabulous, two fabulous books about that. Now, Vicki looks like she's found it. <laughs> and now this is for, um, uh, let's see. Was Charlotte, it? Oh, Charlotte. Charlotte, I don't have Charlotte for some reason on my chat, but she's interested in about babies. So this is a very human thing. And I called it, you can see that. I'll play that, see if they have a, audio goes. The Mystery of the Alternating Nostrils by Vicki Cobb. That's me. Are your two nostrils exactly the same size? Don't struggle to find out by looking in a small mirror. Put your nose right above the mirror and breathe down on it. You will see two circles of moisture as the warm moist air from your nose condenses into water when it hits the cool mirror surface. One circle will be a lot larger than the other. You might conclude that yes, one nostril is bigger than the other, that you will have to live with being lopsided. But wait, I mean, wait an hour or so and do it again. Surprise, this time the small nostril is now the big one. Okay, I'm going to stop that there, but I'm going to show you that it took these pictures of nostrils so you can see one is definitely larger than the other. But when I was thinking about this the other day, you know, science is such an amazing thing. It's always changing. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can show you this. So I have my phone here and I found out if I breathe on my phone, I don't think you can see it, but this little more little circles of moistures uh, appear on your phone and they, they get yes. smaller, but you'll see one is definitely bigger than the yes. other. Yes, I just and did I, it. Yeah, and, and, and you can watch it change. That yesterday when I did it, my, my uh, le right nostril is bigger. Today, my left nostril is bigger. So the, you'll have to read the rest of the minute to find out what the mystery is of the alternating nostrils. Now let's see what we got. Anything else here that um, somebody wants to um, investigate? You might try the other math one, um, the million. Oh, yes, that yeah, the other math one. That was good. We have to. Uh, There's one about um, numbers that I find quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah, let me get that. David, I believe it's David Schwartz. Yeah, David Schwartz is our. Um, okay, there is, and here are a couple here. I'll take what is a light year because that's, he's funny. Great. Hi, this is David Schwartz. I've been wondering about light years ever since I was your age. Now I write books about science and math, and I try to answer some of the questions I've been asking all these years. What is a light year? by David M. Schwartz. A light year is not a year that has gone on a diet. It is not a year that's been trimmed to 300 days. It's not a year spent under high wattage lamps. A light year isn't any kind of year. A light year is a distance. It is a vast distance. The distance light travels in a year. To appreciate a light year, you have to understand how fast light travels. Okay, so that is that, if, and he's, you know, he talks about when you have very big numbers with lots and lots of zeros, it's called Google. And of course, that isn't the same as the Google search engine. So I'm going to stop and let's see if we have any more queries here. Let's see. Okay, and I'll uh, t talk a little bit about David, who lives in California. As you can see, folks, our authors are from all over uh, America. We even have one in England. And as a child, he was very curious, and his books are noted for using not only that curiosity, but as you saw, using humor 
to explain difficult concepts. He says, wondering is wonderful. You don't have to wait till you're 25 years old to have a great idea. You already do, no matter how old you are, as long as you wonder about the world. And as we just saw, the G is for Google, the math alphabet book. He has a book called What in the Wild, meaning like what in the world, about nature's mysteries. And of course, a book that I actually have on my shelves that was given to me by a friend called How Much is a Million? So that's David Schwartz. And let me see, what's Vicki going to put up now? Okay. Here's, we have another natural scientist in our group. I'll play a little bit of this one and show you a picture. We're going to go right. fast so you get the, you get the range. The song for two minutes is called Tiny Frogs Are Big News. Can you name the world's fastest mammal? How about the biggest shark? If you said the cheetah and the whale shark, you're right. It's safe to say we'll probably never discover faster or bigger animals. However, it's still possible to find small animals that can set new records for being tiny. Take frogs, for example. For many years, two kinds of frogs were tied for the honor of being the world's smallest. One species lives in Cuba, the other in Brazil. These frogs are so small that one can perch its whole body on a United States dime. Look at a dime and imagine an adult frog sitting there. Okay, I got one in my backyard that croaks. <laughs> and here's a picture of a tiny frog on a dime. Okay, that's Larry Pringle. He's written lots and lots of books now. I'll find he, something else. He lives in New York. And while Vicki's looking, um, I'll tell you a little bit, bit about him. He's written books on sharks and snakes and scorpions. He had a childhood full of exploring the woods and the creeks and the ponds and reading. And his books include one on owls, one on the secret life of the red fox, and on spiders. So Vicki, are we ready to go? Yes, we're ready to go. Moving right along. You want to keep this so you just get the flavor of everything. And this is Spaced Out by Alexandra Sly. And you'll see, you have to just adjust the sound. Hi, I'm Alexandra Sai. I'm a science writer for kids. Today I'm going to read Spaced Out. Do you ever feel spaced out before you take a test? Yes or no, let's go. Number one, true or false? It's possible for a spacecraft to fly from Earth to Venus to Mars, back to Earth, then to Saturn, out to Pluto, back to Jupiter, and come home to Earth on one tank of fuel. Number two, it's possible for a spacecraft to fly all over the solar system on one tank of fuel because of A, the slingshot effect, B, gravity assist, C, swing by, D, all of the above, E, none of the above. I'm going to stop it there, but she's... Um... She looks at things from a different perspective. She has wonderful art. She's got a, <coughs> a terrific eye. This is, a, this is when we put um, the, the rover uh, satellites on the moon. And she wrote a, a, a book, Cars on Mars, about that. And this guy was the guy who figured out the slingshot effect. And she got all of his papers. So um, you can tell a little bit about um, Alex, and I'll find another one because nobody's, nobody's asking one. So I'm going to just... Uh, okay. So Alex is actually a science history teacher, and her quote to describe her is STEM through the lens, because she does science, technology, engineering, and math, and does a lot of her own photography. She lives in New York State, and uh, the Cars on Mars is a very cool book on roving the red planet. Voyager's Greatest Hits, was a trek into interstellar space. And she's done another cool book called Spider Mania, Friends on the Web. And it's not the web you're thinking of. Okay, Vicki. So we're gonna change, we're gonna change our uh, interest. We're gonna go for music. And um, this, this post is written by Jim Whiting, who has written many, many, many posts. He knows so much that we call him, he's, he likes to run. So instead of being the walking encyclopedia, we call him the running encyclopedia. And this post is about musical 
main is. So I'm gonna get that down to zero and let's see what he has to say. Hi, I'm Jim Whiting and this is Musical Manias. The word mania refers to feelings of frenzy, increased physical activity, and an especially good mood. So when four mop-haired musicians from Liverpool, England, were taking the world by storm in 1963, Canadian music writer Sandy Gardner thought it was the perfect term to describe the effect they had on audiences. A new disease is sweeping through Britain, Europe, and the Far East, and doctors are powerless to stop it. Its name is Beatlemania. The following year, Beatlemania came to the United States when George Harrison, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Ringo Starr performed on The Ed Sullivan Show, a popular television program. During the show and the live concerts that followed, members of the audience, largely teenage girls, screamed and shrieked. The Beatles weren't the first musicians to inspire a mania. That honor belongs to 19th century Hungarian pianist Franz Liszt, whom many music historians call the world's first rock star for his scintillating performances in solo recitals. So I'm gonna stop that. And here's a picture <clears throat> of Franz Liszt playing the piano. And I thought, you know, we can also give you a few notes. Oh, makes me swoon. <laughs> That's called Liebestrom. So we're multimedia. And I think uh, we, it looks like we're almost, we have four minutes. Um, do we share another, another uh, Carol? Daniel, she said, this is fabulous, but I'm looking to see, should we share one more minute? Of, or hey, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit about Jim while you're pulling that up. So as Vicki said, he is very prolific. He's done over 300 books. And he says he writes about stuff he's curious about. And his curiosity goes throughout history, biography, the arts, sports. And Jim lives in uh, Oregon, up in the, on the West Coast. Now, Vicki, what do we have here? You're smiling. Okay. We, can't leave, we can't leave our favorite guy out of here. This. Okay, so this is Jay yeah. Atkins. I mean, he is our interlocutor. He does our podcast. As you can hear, he has a wonderful speaking voice. And he finds quirky things to write about. So here is Jim. Uh, here is Jan Atkins. We call him Atkins, the explainer general. The great Boston molasses flood. How can a tragedy sound funny? <laughs> This is Jan Adkins for the Nonfiction Minute. Most disasters are a cascade. Small failures and minor circumstances, one leading to another, blossom into a cataclysm. On January 16, 1919, a cascade of tremendous size was poised above Boston's North End. The weather was one factor unusually warm for winter. Purity Distilling Company fermented and distilled molasses to make rum and alcohol. The 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibiting sales of alcoholic beverages was due to be passed the very next day. This may have prompted Purity to collect as much rum-making molasses as possible. The enormous tank holding the molasses was about 50 feet tall and 90 feet in diameter, holding 2,300,000 gallons. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a fast... What happened? Story. I know, you want to know what happened? Well, here's a picture in the newspaper of the aftermath of the flood of molasses. <laughs> is that a slow moving flood? Here's what it did to the bridge. And here is the Boston Post. A huge molasses tank explodes in the north end. 11 dead, 50 hurt. So I want to add that uh, Atkins is also a fabulous illustrator and artist. 
He does a lot of his own art. Yeah, he's a, a Renaissance type. And, totally. And, uh, and, he, and he's, he's the voice, he's putting together our podcast, which I are audio files from our nonfiction minutes. So I think that just about wraps it up. Thank you.